The Persistent Problems of Philosophy, An Introduction to Metaphysics Through the Study of Modern Systems, by Mary White and Calkins, Professor of Philosophy and Psychology in Wellesley College, Author of An Introduction to Psychology, Doppelstandpunkt in der Psychologie, A First Book in Psychology, Fourth Revised Edition. Preface. I must admit at the outset that this book is not written to lure students, guiltless of metaphysical aspirations, into pleasant paths of philosophical speculation. It is intended rather for students and readers who are seriously concerned with the problems of philosophy and genuinely anxious to study metaphysics under the guidance of the great thinkers. The book is, nonetheless, designed for beginners in philosophy, as well as for those more advanced, and I have tried to make it clear in statement and logical in order. I have audaciously attempted to combine, also, what seem to me the essential features of a systematic introduction to metaphysics with those of a history of modern philosophy. This I have done both because I believe that the problems of philosophy are, at the outset, best studied as formulated in the actual systems of great thinkers, and because the historical sequence of philosophies, from Descartes to Hegel's, seems to coincide, roughly, with a logical order. I am well aware that in writing a book which seeks to combine two functions, often distinguished, and which attempts to meet the needs of two groups of students, I have run the risk of fulfilling neither purpose and of helping neither set of readers. I hope, however, that certain features of the book may prove useful, in particular, the plan on which it classifies metaphysical systems, the summaries it offers as well of the arguments as of the conclusions of modern philosophers, the exact quotations and multiplied text references of its expositions. If I have overloaded the book with quotations and references, it is because I have myself suffered greatly from my inability to find in the writings of the philosophers the doctrines attributed to them by the commentators. I shall be much disappointed if these citations do not whet the appetite of the reader and send him directly to the texts of Descartes, Leibniz, Berkeley, and the rest. I cannot, indeed, too emphatically express my sense of the value of a study of texts and my conviction that this introduction, and any other, should be used to supplement and not to supplant a reading of the philosophers. The advanced student will, I trust, be aided in such text study by the relative abundance of bibliographical and critical material. In the main, this has been relegated, with the biographies, to the appendix of the book, that the continuity of metaphysical discussion may not be broken. It is only fair to point out, finally, that the book, though mainly exposition and criticism, is written from the standpoint of a metaphysical theory fairly well defined. This I have indicated in my last chapter. My philosophical predilections have inevitably colored my criticisms, but I trust that they have not distorted my interpretation of the thought of the philosophers whom I have considered, and that the book may, therefore, be of service to those who do not agree with its estimates or with its conclusions. The succeeding chapters disclose the nature and extent of my chief intellectual obligations. But I cannot deny myself the pleasure of acknowledging my personal indebtedness to my first instructor in philosophy, Professor H. N. Gardiner, to my constant counselor, Professor George H. Palmer, and to the teacher of my more recent student years, Professor Josiah Royce. For generous and invaluable help in the preparation of this book, I am grateful, beyond my power of expression, to my colleague, Professor Mary S. Case who has read the book in manuscript and has criticized it in detail, to its great advantage, to my father, who has read all the proofs, and to my friend and pupil, Helen G. Hood, who has verified the citations and references of footnotes and appendix, and has prepared the index. Mary White and Calkins. January, 1907. Preface to the Second Edition. It has been necessary to make ready the second edition of this book at a few days' notice, but I have tried, in spite of haste, to profit by the counsels of my critics. I am under special obligation to Professor Ellen B. Talbot of Mount Holyoke College for supplementing a published review by written suggestions. The greater number of the changes which I have made affect my discussions of Hume's doctrine of causality and of Kant's doctrine of the categories. I have altered my statement of the concept of causality, in conformity with Rickert's teaching, by distinguishing, pages 155, 161, 162, et al. 213 sec. Between causal and natural law, I have explicitly attributed to Kant, page 225, the conception of epistemological in addition to that of logical necessity, and I have corrected the passages, pages 205 sec. and 221, in which I have carelessly identified universality and necessity. There may come a later opportunity for more detailed discussion of this whole subject through a section added to the appendix. None of these changes involve, in my opinion, a revision of my general estimate and interpretation of Kant's teaching. To this estimate, with all respect to the views of my conservatively Kantian critics, I still adhere. Changes of statement which involve no important alteration of doctrine are the attempt, page 10, 
to include Kant, Fichte, and Schelling in my table of modern philosophers, the modified exposition, page 29, and the reformulated criticism, pages 48 to 49, of one of Descartes' arguments, the reference, on page 111, to Spinoza, the specific assertion, page 351, footnote, that my interpretation of Schopenhauer diverges from that which is usual, and, finally, the restatement, pages 408 to 409, of the conception of self, and the comparison of this doctrine with that of spiritual substance. I take this opportunity to refer readers, who are interested in the discussion of the nature of the self, to my papers in the Journal of Philosophy for January 30 and for February 27, 1908, and in the Philosophical Review for May, 1908. The remaining changes in the body of the book are merely verbal corrections. Additions to the bibliography are made on pages 506, 556, and 558. The paging of the first edition is retained. Mary White and Calkins. February. 1908. Preface to the Third Edition. The present revision of this book has been undertaken primarily in order to relate its conclusions to the more recent of contemporary philosophical writings, and, in particular, to refer to the arguments against idealism, so loudly urged by the writers who call themselves neorealists. Advantage has also been taken of the opportunity to amend and to supplement many passages of the book. In more detail, the important additions are the following, a summary, pages 42 to 43, of Descartes' Philosophy of Nature, a reference, page 185, note, to modern forms of the Humean doctrine of the self, a statement, pages 399 to 400, of W. P. Montague's conception of consciousness as potential energy, a section, pages 402 to 404, on contemporary neorealism, a brief statement, pages 409 to 410, of the bearing of the facts of so-called multiple personality on the doctrine of the unity of the self, a summary, page 420, note, of Russell's argument in opposition to absolutism, an indication, page 441, of the points of contact between Bergson's conception of time and that of absolutistic personalism, and additions to the bibliography, pages 557 to 559 et al., and supplement, pages 564 to 566. The principal changes are corrections, pages 45, 52, 53, of my earlier formulations of Descartes' criterion of certainty, and of portions of his arguments for the existence of God, a correction, pages 62 to 63, of my former summary of Hobbes' argument for materialism, a restatement, without essential change, pages 122, 130, of part of Berkeley's argument, a more spiritualistic interpretation, pages 339 to 342, of Schelling's identity philosophy, and a rewriting, pages 429, 449, 451 to 452, of certain passages in the discussion concerning absolute will and human freedom. Minor changes occur on pages 9, 10, 69, 99, 163, 216, 237, 331, 336, 337, 407, 424, 428, 447, 485, 492, 494, 500, 515 F, 523 Note, 525 Note, 546, 555 Note, 556. Certain sentences and paragraphs of the earlier editions have been omitted, so that the paging is, in the main, undisturbed. A special attention is called, in conclusion, to two points of terminology, one, to the useful and neglected, distinction between qualitatively and numerically pluralistic or monistic systems, and, two, to the use, throughout the book, of the term idealism, in the widest possible sense to mean the conception of reality, as of the nature of consciousness. The present-day tendency to identify idealism either with idism or with subjective idealism is much to be regretted, for there is no other term by which to cover both idism, the Humean doctrine that reality reduces to momentary states of consciousness, and spiritualism, or personalism, the doctrine that the universe is throughout personal. In this wider use, the term idealism applies not only to idism and to subjective idealism, the form of spiritualism which teaches that the universe narrows to my consciousness, but also to the other forms of spiritualism, to pluralistic spiritualism, the doctrine of Leibniz and Berkeley and Ward, and to absolutistic spiritualism, the doctrine of Hegel, of Royce, of Besenket, which the last chapter of this book expounds and upholds. Mary White and Calkins. July, 1912. Preface to the Fourth Edition.
The issue of a fourth edition of this book gives opportunity for a few changes. The description of the self, page 408, and the discussion of freedom, pages 451 to 453, have been rewritten. Bibliographical references have been added to the footnotes of pages 404, 408, 410, 425, 447. Other changes are made on pages 65, 205, 224, 237, 244, 351, 404, 517, 518, 557. Mary White and Calkins. December, 1916.